Okay. So you. Uh, if you would mind just saying at the end of your comments that an evaluation will be sent to you via email to complete uh, to the guide of the course that was entered, and it will be in your advice. Oh, okay. Okay. Awesome. Well, we'll get people admitted back there, and we'll get. I'll give you a thumbs up and right. Oh, start. okay. Thank you very soon. Me or something? Whatever you're comfortable with, or you can stand here. Okay. Podiums are so nice. See, isn't this a Christian class? We don't have to take this as we can. Well, this is all new, and we invested in like another big dollar, but it's because it's associated with Hope College. I know. Hope College is not so poor. Can I have a swig of your water? What a slide I picked to say that was very like I love it. Good morning, everybody. <laughs> Good morning. Morning. Welcome. Thank you for coming this morning. So Sarah Crawford joined. Oh, please turn your phones off, please. Thank you. Sarah Crawford joined Carnegie Museum of Natural History as director of exhibitions in November 2020. She has a BA in Advertising and Design from the Art Institute of Pittsburgh and has a Master's of Fine Arts degree in Museum Exhibition Planning and Design from the University of the Arts in Philadelphia. She has worked as an exhibition developer and exhibition manager for over 11 years, first at Peggy Notabart Nature Museum and the Field Museum in Chicago San Diego Museum of Us, and at the Natural History Museum of Los Angeles County. In that time, she has developed more than 20 permanent traveling and temporary exhibitions. And straight from Pittsburgh, who arrived at after one o'clock in the morning, after a full day's work, my daughter, our daughter, Sarah Crawford. Thank you. <laughs> Thing. This is how we're going to handle questions. Sarah said she's going to take questions during the presentation. Mm -hmm. Feel free to ask them. I'm not going to run around with the microphone because I always worry about tripping. So she will repeat the question so the audience at home can hear. And then at the end of the 
lecture, then I'll come around with the microphone. So thank you. All right. <laughs> so can everybody hear me okay? It seems like the sound system is, is good. Okay, great. Yeah, I prefer to do questions during, because I'd love this to be conversational. Um, so feel free to just, you know, raise your hand. I'll call on you, repeat the question to make sure I got it right and I understood. Um, and it'll also give me a minute to think <laughs> about my answer. So that's always another benefit as well. Um, so thank you, mom, <laughs> for the introduction. Uh, I am so happy to be here today. Uh, my parents moved to Holland, Michigan about, I think, six years ago. And I think one of the first groups they joined was HASP, and I have been hearing about it nonstop ever since. Um, so I'm really privileged to speak with you today. And I've heard a lot about the, the different speakers you've had, and I'm really uh, pleased to number myself among them. So uh, thank you for the opportunity. Um, all right, so today uh, I'm going to start by giving you an overview of how natural history museums work. Um, my dad actually recommended, John, that I do this. Um, because uh, there's a lot of things that you might not expect if you're just a casual museum visitor. Um, and then I'm gonna talk a little bit about how we develop exhibitions at a natural history museum. Um, and then I'm going to use a specific case study of an exhibition I worked on while I was at the Field Museum um, to give an example of how exhibit teams can use unexpected opportunities to create memorable experiences. And then I'm gonna leave you with a question about what exhibition you would plan uh, given some of the unexpected opportunities that I currently have at the Carnegie Museum of Natural History. Um, so that's kind of my agenda. And just to give you a little bit of background how I got into this field. So I started in advertising, as my mom said. Um, and I, when I started working in advertising, I realized that I'd made a terrible mistake. Uh, so I ended up looking around for some career that would allow me to um, be involved in education. Both my parents were, were teachers in different forms. Um, and so museums seemed like the natural place for me. Um, and when I first started working at museums, I was surprised um, to learn how many paths uh, lead to a new exhibition. Um, I, I don't know how I thought exhibitions got developed, but I didn't realize all of the chance an opportunity um, that, that kind of lead to the final product. And so that's kind of the idea for this presentation today is I'm gonna talk about some of the unplanned things um, that lead to the exhibitions you see when you walk around a natural history museum. Um, in some case, cases, we start with very few restrictions, um, but typically uh, there's a lot of unplanned legacies from the past that we're dealing with anytime we uh, start a new project. All right. Okay, so to talk a little bit about natural history museums. Um, natural history museums are essentially an encyclopedia of life on earth. Um, when you walk into a museum, you may not realize that about one-tenth of 1% 1 of the collection is what you see on the floor. So that means we have 99.9% .9 more bugs in our collection than what you see in the exhibit cases. 99.9% .9 more um, you know, baskets and birds in our storage spaces. Um, so that may be kind of astounding. I didn't realize that a lot of everyday visitors don't realize that we have these really vast collections. And scientists working in our institution around the world study this material to explain the past, evaluate the present and predict the future. Natural history museums are maintained in the public trust. So what does that mean? Uh, that means that um, essentially the public owns the collections. Um, so they should be kept available to the public so, we can, so they can study them, enjoy them and learn from them. Um, and, and that's another thing I didn't realize when I started working at natural history museums. We have to think about you all. You all own in a lot of ways, uh, the collections at a museum. So the Carnegie Museum of Natural History, where I currently work, this is a photograph of the Carnegie Museum, the exterior. Um, we have more than 22 million objects in our collection. Um, we have the fifth largest natural history collection in the United States, um, which I looked recently, Pittsburgh is about 60th in terms of size. So that's a very outsized collection uh, given the size of the city. And given the name of the institution, you probably have a sense of why we have so many. Carnegie, you know, the time in which he was, um, well, when he started the museum, essentially, um, 
Pittsburgh was bigger <laughs> and, uh, you know, he had, of course, a, a vast fortune. And so it allowed him to, you know, put a lot of uh, money towards uh, those collections. Um, so that was one of the things that drew me to the museum is the wonderful collections and the scientists working there. So now I'm going to give you a quick overview of the different collections at the museum. And most natural history museums have these same types of collections. Uh, maybe with one or two additions or one or two subtra subtractions, kind of depending. Um, so this is a photo of someone in our invertebrate zoology collection. We have over 13 million species representing all insect lineages, as well as substantial ho holdings of other aquatic and terrestrial arthropods. Um, so this is a huge collection. And one of the reasons I really like this photo is you can see each of these insects is on a little pin. Right. So, um, yeah, so this is someone's job. And the other thing, I, can you see it in the photo? There's these tiny little labels that are about this big that are handwritten, the object number for each of these insects. So to me, this is kind of an extraordinary. Yeah, go for it. So, so when they... So that when they display this to the public, does each, the whole case go, or do they take a pen and stick it in some piece of wood? That is, yeah, so the question is, um, so when they display one of these insects for the public, do they take the whole case or do they take an individual fly or bee or whatever and put that on display? Is that, is that your question? Okay, great. Um, so we would choose, we would probably choose one fly. <laughs> <laughs> and so that that has been, you know, in various exhibitions, that sometimes has been my job. And I'll talk a little bit more about that. But if you have this size of a, a box full of insects, and they're all the same species, you have to select one. And I remember when I first started working at the museum, you know, you just pretend like you're very confident about this decision, even though to me, I'm not a scientist. I could not tell the difference, you know? So um, I, I, that's something I should have said earlier. So, you know, my mom mentioned that I, my background is in advertising and design, and um, I don't have a science background. So, uh, you know, I, but this is actually a benefit working in exhibitions because, you know, I'm coming at things from a kind of a, a layman's perspective. So if there's something I'm excited about or that attracts me visually, you know, there's a better chance that uh, the public will also feel the same way. So, you know, the scientists, um, we had one gentleman at the Field Museum who had been working on, he'd been researching lobster sex for like 40 years. I mean, that is so specific. Like I can't, I, can't, I that to me, I would eventually get bored, but nope, that's what his job was. Um, so, you know, they get very focused on their one area of study. And as an exhibition developer, part of what I'm trying to do is, is get them to tell their story, you know, to sum up their 40 year research of lobster sex in a 60 word label. So imagine trying to do that. Imagine taking your whole career and trying to sum that up in 60 words for somebody that's never met you, that doesn't know anything about your career. So that's, that's what we do in exhibitions. And so that is a huge challenge. So, you know, in some ways, you know, this is a great example. It's one small example of kind of what we do overall is, is we have this vast amount of knowledge that we're taking in from these scientists. And then we have to pick that one fly to put out on the floor for visitors and to try to make that meaningful. So it's, it's very tough, yeah. This is a scientist. Yes, this is a scientist. Looking at these little things, and just as happily as some of I know. I, yeah, the, so the observation was about the photo that you see the scientist looking very happily at this drawer full of flies. And, and that, that is a great observation. And that's exactly why I love what I do, because every one of these scientists is incredibly passionate about their research. And so it is such a privilege for me to just learn more about what they do and interview them and, and try to bring that to the general public. So yeah, so great, great observation and really good question. Thank you. Okay, so the next section. Um, so these are photos from our big bone room and our little bone room. <laughs> We really have a big bone room and a little bone room. So when you walk through the basement hallways at the Carnegie Museum of Natural History, there are doors that say that. Big bone room, little bone room. Um, and we have the third best um, dinosaur collection uh, in the country next to the American Museum of Natural History and the Smithsonian. 
of course, th these best designations can always be argued, but, <laughs> but according to you know the curator, um, we have the third best. And the majority of the dinosaur collection was um, built through staff field efforts in the American West through 1899 and 1923. So just kind of, again, a lot of this is opportunity. The reason why we were able to acquire these specimens is because we were collecting at the right time. We had money at the right time. You know, it was available. Um, so we were able to kind of get in and, and build our collection very early. Um, we also have an invertebrate paleontology collection, um, which has over 800,000 specimens including 5,400 type specimens. So just very quickly, what are type specimens? So a type specimen, it's a single sp specimen uh, expressly designated as the name bearing type by the original author of the species. And so that means that, okay, so we have a Tyrannosaurus rex jawbone type specimen. So that means all future Tyrannosaurus rex jawbones that are discovered, they will reference this specimen um, as the type, like what should it look like? What am I looking for? And so it's a, it's a special designation um, for specimens within the collection. And so from a scientific standpoint, they're very important. Um, you know, they ensure that scientists have a single point of reference um, when they're talking about a particular organism. So there's only one type per species? There's only one type uh, for, per, per part of each. Yeah. 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 No, one else that. no one else has a Tyrannosaurus type specimen jawbone. Um, so that's why I, I'm trying to remember, but several, I guess maybe five or six years ago, there was a fire at a natural history museum in South America. I don't, I, I was gonna check before I brought it up in the presentation, but one of the reasons it's such a big loss when a natural history museum burns or you know is looted or has other issues is because you have these type specimens only place in the world you know, with that. Um, and so an incredible amount of knowledge is lost. Um, so, so natural history museums are holding for, for these kinds of um, specimens, which is a very important part of our mission. And, you know, natural history museums, you can imagine us, um, I said in an encyclopedia of life, and I would say that's all natural history museums collectively are an encyclopedia of life. And so scientists will travel from, you know, someplace in Europe to you know, the Carnegie Museum uh, to see a particular species that they're studying because we have this particular specialty in our collection. Uh, and the, tr the opposite is true, that our scientists travel all over the world to visit collections and other institutions. Um, all right. So this is from our mollusk collection. Um, we have 1.3 million specimens. <laughs> 1.3 million. Yeah, this is one of the most beautiful collections. Yeah. And our, our uh, collections manager of mollusks, um, he's kind of like the librarian. We have every, every um, scientific section has a collections manager and a curator. Um, and then you also frequently have um, associate curators, postdoc students that are helping. Um, our collections manager for mollusk is TikTok famous. He tells mollusk jokes. So if any of you are curious, we've got a great TikTok following. He's like wonderful. He's wonderful. His name's Tim Pierce. So just kind of a side note there. If any of you want some fun jokes. Uh, so this is from our section of amphibians and reptiles, our herpetology collection. Um, so all of these are specimens, what we call wet specimens. So they're in uh, like an alcohol um, solution. I don't, it's, I think it's ethanol. I don't remember what the exact percentages are, but it essentially pres preserves a specimen. And, and so it's, you know, we also have an, uh, like a, a bone collection for amphibians and reptiles, but this is the primary way that natural history museums preserve um, amphibians and reptiles and also fishes, but we happen to, we don't have a fish collection um, at the Carnegie Museum, but we do have uh, 230,000 specimens from over 500 species across nearly all amphibian and reptile families. Um, and some specimens date back to 1870. So someone's job is to go through and, and make sure that all of these alcohol jars are topped off. Are any of them extinct? There, we definitely, uh, the question was, are any of them extinct? Um, and definitely, yeah, we have uh, in every single section, we have uh, examples of extinct animals. Yeah, yeah. 
So it's, yeah, it's uh, important. That's another reason you're right. Natural history museums are important is, you know, sometimes it's the only place you can see these animals. Okay. Okay, so this is from our uh, minerals collection. Um, we have the most complete and comprehensive, of course, Pennsylvania minerals collection in the world. Not surprising, we're in Pennsylvania. Um, and the uh, best minerals exhibit suite of specimens from the US, uh, from several countries, including the former Soviet Union, India, and Bulgaria, and Romania. So again, that's kind of a specific thing. Other natural history museums have the best collections for other countries. So again, that's kind of why that shared knowledge is so important. Uh, this is one of my favorite collections, uh, our section of botany. Um, so we're a major research facility in Western Pennsylvania with a worldwide reach. Um, at its heart is the Carnegie Museum Herbarium, uh, a scientifically and culturally important collection with over 540,000 plant specimens. Uh, and we're ranked above uh, at, among the top two herbaria in North America by size. Um, and in this collection, we have over 3000 type specimens. Um, so. I mean, I, one of the one, there's like a group um, of specimens in this collection uh, that were collected in France in like 1754, between 754 and, and 1796. So again, you just have, and these are, these were donated uh, by by another institution. So again, you have this wide range, um, you know. And I, I, one of the reasons I really love visiting this section is is seeing their drying process. They have like a like a heat lamp. <laughs> and the specimen like sitting underneath it and it just dries it out over time. And the way they collect them in the field is they have like newspaper and they press it just like I'm, I remember when I was growing up, you know, I don't know if any of you ever did this pressing flowers. It's pretty much the same process that they use. Um, and then something that else I love about this is so in the collection you have the specimens I just mentioned from like the 1700s. And then the way that they're collecting specimens today is they're frequently using QR codes to track where um, each specimen was collected. Um, so these herbaria sheet, um, you'll have one that you know looks like this. These are more traditional. And then the new ones have a little QR code in the bottom corner. So I just love thinking about that range, You know how much collecting has changed over time and how technology is allowing us to, to collect in new ways. But it's wonderful because through the QR code, you can track exactly where you picked that plant. You know, So it just allows for you know, a very kind of focused yeah, I'm having a difficult time thinking about how these are displayed because they're flat pressed pieces. Yeah. So, so your the question was, I'm having a difficult time thinking about how these are displayed, and you are making another great observation. So, the funny thing is, exhibits are not the point at all for natural history museums. So, so, so my job is to figure out how to all this stuff, you know. It, it started out as cabinets of curiosity, you know, like wealthy collectors, you know, went around the world and gathered all this material and put it up in their homes, essentially. So it was kind of a way to boast. But exhibitions are kind of just a byproduct. Really, it's about the research, you know. So there are frequently things in the collection that are not very attractive or visually very interesting. You know, if you're talking to the scientist about it, it's very compelling, um, but if you're just looking at it and you don't have any context, it's not necessarily interesting. And so that's a big challenge, you know, and, and frequently when I'm touring the collections with the curators, I'll hear them say, oh, that's, how do I show that? Or that's not very interesting. And I always say, you know, don't worry about it. That's my job to figure out how to make this interesting. And so in an exhibition frequently, you know, you have objects that you're displaying or specimens that you're displaying that aren't necessarily charismatic. And then you have other things that you design that will help you kind of tell that story, like dioramas, videos, interactives. Well, I'm thinking something like this, a display might be how they went out into the field, track down this rare plant. Yes. So the observation was. Exactly, yeah. Exactly, so the, the observation was, you know, you, she could imagine that what you're showing is how they were collected. Um, and then the, the objects are maybe off to the side, the specimens are off to the side, and that's absolutely correct. So for, we just did a new botany exhibit 
Um, you know, we didn't have a ton of funding, um, but we did create a video showing them collecting the specimens in the field. And then we did kind of a, like a process video showing like them being pressed and then them being dried and then, you know, putting it out on display. So um, you're right. That's exactly what we do is we try to look for ways to, to bring these stories to life for visitors. And then we have an anthropology and archaeology collection. Um, you know, we have the largest extant collection of upper Ohio River Valley materials, um, which dates primarily from the 1940s. That's when it came into our museum. Um, we also have uh, Costa Rican and Egyptian collections, which are particularly fine. Um, and we are currently working on a new Hall of Egypt. So that's that's one of the projects that I've been working on. Um, and this is some of the most difficult material to interpret um, because it, a lot of the cultures that were displayed in natural history museums are not European. Um, so there was a tendency to kind of otherize some of these cultures that we were, we were looking at. And so you may notice if you visit an art museum, typically there is more focus on um, European history. And at natural history museums, we tend to interpret um, Native American history, African culture. Um, so you, there's a big change in natural history museums now to kind of talk more about why we have anthropological objects in our care. You know, why do we have a hall of Egypt next to a diorama hall about animals from all over the world? Like, how do you, how do, how do you reconcile that? Like, like, how are we telling these stories? So this is a, I'm not going to go into too much more detail about this, but this is a huge challenge. This is one of the biggest challenges in natural history museums right now is, is figuring out how to talk about our anthropological collections. And there's a big movement towards, you know, working in conjunction with communities to interpret their material. And in the past, it would be scientists or curators speaking about a culture and not consulting anyone from that culture and how they were interpreted. So uh, this is a, it's a big challenge um, for natural history museums. We also have, uh, yes, please. Speaking of that, you've heard about museums returning items. Is the Carnegie doing that? So the question was, you've heard about museums returning items and is the Carnegie Museum doing that? In, in, in some cases, yes. So the observation was um, that they were taken from everywhere. In some cases, they were purchased. In some cases, they were excavated, sometimes in conjunction with, you know, people from, you know, wherever they were uh, found. Um, but uh, so there, so there is a, there's a national law called NAGPRA, which is Native American Graves Repatriation Act. And so that is a national law. Um, and under that law, all natural history, all museums, um, have to contact tribal entities and enter into dialogue with them about what they would like to happen to their uh, ancestors, their human remains, and any objects associated with those human remains. So any grave goods that are found with those remains. So that is a national law. So all museums have a nag, all museums that have human remains have a NAGPRA representative that is reaching out to tribal entities to, to do that work. Um, and that went into place in the mid nineties, I believe. Um, so, so that's an important piece. Um, so yes, the Carnegie Museum and all other museums are, are engaged in this work. Um, unfortunately, NAGPRA only covers North American. So if we have human remains from South America under NAGPRA, we technically do not have to um, reach out to those tribal communities and offer to return their ancestors. Um, but museums are, there is a, a, a sea change. Museums are beginning to do that voluntarily. And I know this is, this is another controversial issue because, um, you know, of course we wanna learn about our past. We wanna learn about humans in the past. And so there's a lot of, you know, delicate negotiation happening with how we do that. Um, good question. All of these are good questions, by the way. I really appreciate it. Um, so we also have a mammals collection um, and we have 151 families of extant mammals. Um, extant, extant is not, is the opposite of extinct. So living, yeah. Um, and we have 27 of the 29 mammalian orders represented in our collection. So again, this just kind of gives you a sense of the breadth of what we have. 
And then our birds collection. So I wanted to end here. Um, I'm not end the presentation, but end my kind of overview of, of collections with birds. Um, so the Carnegie Museum birds collection is the seventh largest ornithology collection in the United States. Um, we have over, over two thirds of the collection comes from outside of the United States, um, but a great representation from Pennsylvania and our region as well. Uh, and the collection includes over 6,550 species or roughly 64% of all extant species of birds currently alive in the world. So again, kind of very, we have a lot of, we have a lot. That's kind of what all of this is to say. And this is just one natural history museum that I'm giving you an overview of. Every natural history museum has this kind of collection. So it's not just us. And so one of the reasons I wanted to end here um, in my collections overview is to give you an example of how these collections are used. Because one of the things we hear from visitors frequently, when you give them a sense of all that we have, it's, you know, the question is, well, why do you need 500 squirrels? <laughs> like, why do you need 7,000 eggs? You know, like, what is the point? Yeah, so it's, so it's, it's a good, it's a good question. Um, and, and again, it's, it's, it's go back to the Encyclopedia of Life reference, you know, think about um, each of these is a data point. Each of these species, each, each individual specimen is a, is a data point that a scientist can use in their research. Um, so I'm, I'm currently working with the, the curator of ornithology. His name is um, Dr. Chase Mendenhall. And he has been studying uh, birds in Costa Rica in coffee plantations for the last 16 years. He's considered very new. <laughs> So this is, you know, this research will help make his career. Um, and we're currently writing a grant um, to, to get funding for some of this research. And uh, what his, his re research has shown is that um, there's a lot of uh, birds that are, that are dying in these, in these coffee plantations. These, these populations are not thriving. And uh, what they've noticed is that this is um, that, the, that it's due to low birth rate. It's not due to mortality when they're older. And so what this research will do is they're very concrete about this. They're you know, going to put camera traps. They're going to um, have people stationed to do observation in person field observation. And they're going to figure out why, why are these young birds not thriving? Why are they dying? That's what they, they want to be on the coffee plantations and do these observations to figure out what is happening. And then as part of this grant, they're doing a portion of that, which is referred to as broader impacts. And the goal with a broader impact section of a grant is to um, have a broader impact, something that benefits the community. And so what he's going to do uh, in conjunction with his colleagues from Costa Rica is work with the coffee plantation owners and the farmers and look at the data that they've developed and develop a plan for how to combat you know, the death of those young birds. So that to me is, it's such a, it's so practical. It's like, yes, yeah, these birds are dying. Let's figure out why they're dying. Let's talk to the people that own the land on which they are dying and come up with a plan of how to combat that. That, that is very concrete, you know, and the only way that he can do this work is by being in the field, doing that research, you know, and, and part of what he's doing will be collecting, you know, the birds that have died and doing some research, looking at, looking at those those bodies and uh, determining why. So, so that those items will come in, those specimens, I should say, would come into our collection as well um, for future research. Question from online about species extinction. Great. Um, if anyone connected with the museum has researched extinction in relation to CO2 concentration in the air, if you're aware of that at all. I don't, I do not know the answer to that off the top of my head, um, but I do know that Every, every, we, we, we have actually, uh, one of the sections that I didn't talk about because it doesn't have a collection is we have a section of Anthropocene studies, um, which is, is looking at, you know, climate change essentially. And all of the new curators that we are hiring, um, have, uh, an expertise in, in looking at, um, you know, how climate change is, is causing, uh, some of the things they're observing in the natural world. So the, the, the curator of botany, for example, one of the things he's doing as part of a community science project um, is tracking when plant species bloom. 
and and he's working with kind of a whole field. I don't know if if any of you have heard about community science or, or citizen science projects, but it's a way for you know everyday people to get involved in science. And so essentially, you know, some plant track uh, plant <laughs> trackers. You know, there's apps where you can you know track um, you know or identify plants. And sometimes they'll have a feature that allows you to like uh, make an observation, take a photo. A lot of that data for for certain applications gets combined into a community network, and then scientists are reviewing that data. Um, it depends on the app you're using, but um, there's one called Nature's Notebook where you're you're tracking when a plant blooms, and that helps us figure out um, how how plants are being affected by the changing environment. So are they blooming at different times? Are you no longer finding them in certain regions? Are they moving to higher elevations? Um, so I, I don't think this is totally answering this individual's question, but there's a lot, you know, that we're, we're looking at in our, our current world, you know, and, and there's a, the scientists are, are doing a lot of research to, to observe some of the changes that are happening in our world. Yes. How do they preserve these birds just sitting there like this? Yeah. How do they preserve the birds? Uh, so these are what are referred to as study skins. So when you uh, walk through a natural history museum, we have a bird hall and there are a lot of birds, you know, posed on a little perch. That is not how we store birds in our collection. The way that we store birds in the collection is like this. Um, and we generally have people at natural history museums whose job it is to prepare the birds. Prepare is a very nice word for skinning. So, um, and in the LA County Museum of Natural History, they're in the birds collection. There was a big table and they had about 10 volunteers every day that would come in. They would take the bird bodies out of the freezer and they would pull the skins off, take the flesh out and stuff uh stuff the birds with like a it's like a i think it's like a cottony i never yeah um it, and and it usually is treated with some sort of chemical so so these these birds do not have skeletons inside they're there's they're the skins and most most of the in the mammals collection is the same it's it's the skins um and they also uh frequently store the skeletons separately um, but they'll they'll have associated data, so you know. Okay, this skull goes to that skin, so it's it's interesting. Yes. Well, if they're tracking, like, okay, they do the skinning. Yeah. Aren't they losing? Like, at least they keep the skeleton, but then they're losing a lot of data. So the question is, if they're if they're trying to track, yeah, if if they're tracking, you know, all they can about these these animals, these species. And if you remove, of course, the organs and the, and the flesh, you're losing a lot of data. That's true. Um, but how do you, what would you do? What's the alternative? So I, something I didn't mention actually is the mammals collection. Um, we, because this is a similar problem, mammals and birds are stored very similarly. They've started to keep tissue samples, frozen tissue samples. And so that is a newer innovation. And then we are able to do DNA testing. Do they weigh the organs and all that? Well, That's a great question. I don't know. Yeah. So the question was, do they weigh the organs or gather data in that way? I do know that they'll, they'll weigh the specimens when they come in. So you have some data there, but I don't know if they do any specific descriptions of the organs or any other, any of the other material. It would be a lot of work. Yes. Why is the skin the most important? I mean, it's visually beautiful. Yeah. So a lot of it is, so why are the skins important? Uh, feathers? are important. And then a lot of what they're looking at is body size or morphological changes, like the, the size or shape of the beak. Um, you know, something you'll, you'll notice, oh gosh. And again, sorry, I'm not a scientist. So I, 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 I'm a storyteller. I try to do the best I can, but I might get some of these details wrong, but I do know. So we have seen bird body sizes shrinking. So as the world gets warmer, body sizes are getting smaller. And so you see that in the collection. I saw a photo that I didn't use for this, except in humans, it's probably true. Uh, but, but so I saw, I did see a photo of a collection looking at the same species of bird, you know, from Pittsburgh a hundred years ago versus today. And you can see a visual change in the body size. Um, so, so things like that, you, you're absolutely losing some data, but you have to balance that, you know, with having none, <laughs> having none. exactly. Yeah. So 
the other example I'll give is also birds related. And I, you know, thanks to my dad for recommending that I, I bring this story up. Um, but there's a link between eggshell thinning and DDT that was identified using museum and personal egg collections. And this evidence from museum collections uh, helped lead to a ban on DDT. So that, I don't know if any of you remember that, but it was realized that the use of this, yeah, it, it led to um, the thinning of these eggshells. And so by looking at eggshells from a hundred years ago versus you know the 1960s, they were able to see a significant difference. And that evidence was used in arguments to get that to get DDT banned. So that is a very practical example, again, of how museum collections can be used to influence policy and you know, to help us learn more about our world. So finally, exhibitions, <laughs> finally to my part. Um, so as I kind of hinted at earlier, you know, my job is to look at these 22 million objects and to try to make sense of it for visitors. Um, so you think you're overwhelmed, you know, when you go to the grocery store and try to decide what brand of cereal you want. Imagine, you know, trying to choose between 50 examples of the same type of mineral, you know, that it is a challenge. Um, so my job as an exhibitions director is to figure out what to display, what story to tell, about that display, so the label, how the label should look, how the display should look, that means the case, the case layout, you know, how it sits in a case, um, how to light that display, and then how to maintain that display over time. So that is what an exhibitions department does, is all of that, that's it's a huge challenge. <laughs> I'm wondering how I'm doing on time, by the way. Oh, okay. Doing okay. So this is a typical project team uh, for an exhibitions department, um, or sorry, this is a typical project team for developing an exhibition. Um, so we have the planning group that includes uh, the directors, myself, uh, project management and uh, fundraising. We have exhibition developers, and they're the people that work with the curators to write the labels. And I should say this is specific to a natural history museum. This is not Art museums are different, history museums are different. You've heard about curators. So curators at a natural history museum do research, they're scientists. And then they work with a writer, a creative person to help interpret that science for the general public. So at an art museum, curators write the labels. So it's a little different. Um, we also bring in content experts. You know, people, as I said in the past, museums would just talk about another culture and not talk to them about it first. So now we've moved away from that. We bring content experts in from um, different groups that we work with or interpret. Um, we also have community advisors that, that play that same kind of role. We have collections involved uh, because the job of a museum, again, is to hold and maintain these collections for the public trust and for research. Anytime we put something on the floor, we have to make sure it's safe. So we have to think about things like a light level. When it's on the floor, the light will degrade the object. So we have very strict rules about how much light we can put on it. Um, we have to think about temperature and humidity because those things will degrade the objects over time. Um, so we have conservators whose job it is to keep an eye on those things. We also have designers. Uh, as I said, they kind of think about how the display should look, you know, visually how we're telling this story. Then we have an education and lifelong learning team, um, and their job is to work with the public on the floor to interpret um, these stories. We also have a technical team that maintains the exhibits, keeps the light bulbs changed, keeps the air flowing, you know, makes sure everything's painted, you know, um, and, and we also have like media and interactives that help us tell the story uh, in that way. And then we have production. Um, they fabricate and install and uh, do some exhibit maintenance as well. So this kind of gives you a sense. It is a huge group of people that make each of those exhibitions. So there's a lot that goes into it. And then I'm not gonna talk about this in any detail, but this gives you a sense of our process. So we have four phases that we go through for each project. Um, and this process for an exhibition can take 10 years. It can take 10 years to develop an exhibition, or it can take three months. And every time you go through these same phases, it just might happen very quickly, or it might happen over a long period of time. Yes. Do you know ahead of time how long it's going to take? I mean, do you have a sense for how long? The question was, do we know ahead of time how long it's going to take? And I'd say yes. You know, if uh, so, I mentioned that I'm going to be redeveloping our Hall of Ancient Egypt. 
um, given you know those objects will require conservation, a lot of treatment. Um, they're very delicate. We have to make sure that they're you know in stable environments. And um, so it's expensive. So typically if something's expensive, it's gonna take longer, more rounds of review, you know, more outside parties involved. Yes. Yeah, how often is an exhibit changed? That typically has to do with funding. So the, the Carnegie Museum of Natural History it's in an interesting moment because Carne Carnegie, the name Carnegie obviously had a lot of money behind it. Pittsburgh does not. So, um, you know, we have this wonderful collection, all of these objects in our care, all of these specimens, and frankly, not enough money to maintain them. So um, we have most of our exhibitions, the newest exhibition, newest permanent exhibition um, was, was opened in 2009. So that is a long time ago. We have an exhibition on the floor from the 1980s. Um, and so the content is outdated, but without, you know, it, it, the, the Egypt Hall we're working on um, will take about $5 million to create, and it's only about 3,000 square feet. Um, and a lot of that is because of the objects in our care to make sure that the, 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 the climate is appropriate. Like 500,000 of that is like an HVAC system. <laughs> so things like that, that you don't think of, you know, we, airflow is so important. Climate is so important in these galleries. So, um, it's, it's very expensive, but you know, you can do a single case display or you can do, um, like if we were like, like art museums, art exhibits tend to cost a lot less. So it'll be about $50 a square foot, whereas a natural history permanent exhibition will be about $800 a square foot. So it's a vast difference. So yeah, tricky, tricky answer because it really depends. Yeah. Okay. So I feel like you guys are all getting a pretty good sense of how this works, um, but I'm gonna go into more detail about exhibition in particular now. Um, so, uh, Basically, when you're developing a museum exhibition, you try to plan for the unplanned because there's a lot of factors that go into this that you can't control. Um, so I will give an, a hypothetical example, which is kind of true, but mostly hypothetical. Um, so the, I'll start with the unplanned circumstances. So let's say you have a donor, you know, somebody approaches you, he's very passionate about reptiles and amphibians, very passionate about herpetology. He comes to the museum, he says, I have a lot of money. So that's a circumstance that's beyond your control. This guy happens to love frogs. So also another factor that I can't control is what was collected by previous staff. So let's say we also happen to have an anthropology curator in the 1920s who was also passionate about frogs. So we randomly happen to have a huge collection of frogs. That doesn't mean that you know, this culture made a lot of frogs. It just means that when this curator was in the field purchasing objects for the collection, he liked frogs and so bought a ton of them. So that's another circumstance that today I can't control. We have this weird large collection of frogs. There's also the factor of time and environment, another thing you can't control. So if you think about the material history of a culture, you know, when you find what is left um, from these different cultures, you think about what objects were made of. So if something was made of cloth, it's not around. If something was, it, well, depends on the environment, but certainly in Pennsylvania, you don't find any baskets. You don't find any cloth. It's a very wet environment that doesn't get preserved over time. So now all you have is frogs that are made of stone or pottery because that holds up to time in the environment. So all of these circumstances are beyond my control as an exhibits person. We just happen to have a lot of stone frogs. So then you go to how do you plan for the unplanned? The first thing is the opportunity, right? So then you have to have that person in the fundraising department that approaches that passionate donor that loves frogs and uh, gives them a tour of the frogs collection in anthropology and the person decides to donate a ton of money. So then that's where I come in. So all of these things that have already happened that are beyond my control, they come to me as the exhibitions person and say, we're doing a frogs exhibit. I'm like, great, okay, this is how I wanna spend my time. Um, and so then I, I have a few choices to make. The first set of choices is scientific choices. Um, so I work with the anthropology team to interpret the cultures that made these frogs. You know, so those are kind of, I can choose which stories to tell, but I work with a curator to determine what kind of the breadth of those stories are. And then there's the visitor choice. Um, 
we end up with essentially a giant exhibit featuring uh, huge frogs that visitors can climb on because visitors love climbing on things and interactivity. So you get a set, this is a hypothetical example, but you get a sense of all of the things, all the factors that are kind of beyond my control, some that are in my control that go into the creation of an exhibition. So now I'm gonna give you a very specific, definitely true example. Okay, so six years ago, I worked at the Field Museum as a content developer uh, in their exhibitions department. One project that I worked on uh, is near the end of my time was to create a new diorama in one of the existing exhibit halls. So this was very exciting uh, to, to somebody who loves natural history museums, dioramas. The majority of them were created across the country between like, the early 1900s and 1940s at the latest, but the bulk of them were 1910, 1920, around that era. So to create a new diorama is a very big deal. We're very excited. Uh, and dioramas have been at the heart of the Field Museum since its founding in 1893. Uh, today, nearly 90 individual handcrafted displays take visitors on a journey across the globe from the lush, dense jungles of India to the vast open plains of Africa. The dioramas at the Field Museum represent some of the most extensive collections of animals in the world exhibited in their natural settings but there was one diorama that was out of place. Can you spot it? I think I hinted, give a hint in my opening slide, but it's these hyenas. What are the hyenas doing in a you know, amphibian and reptile hall? That doesn't make any sense. So over the years, this is kind of another unplanned circumstance that tends to be beyond our control. Uh, we ran out of space. And so this hyena diorama that was created in 1905 by probably the most famous taxidermist of all time, Carl Akeley, uh, was relegated to the museum's reptile hall. So it, it was out of context, didn't make any sense. It felt very out of place. And the other thing to know is these cases, these are panes of glass. These are not panes of safety glass, they are panes of actual glass. That is huge, it's a huge piece of glass. So you have to get that off. And then the other thing with a lot of um, these dioramas is when they were created, they didn't totally understand how these chemicals that they used to preserve these animals uh, would impact people. So they frequently used um, you know, hazardous chemicals. So there, there's, in this diorama in particular, you can't see it in this photo, but there's like a tray at the top with like a little kind of shallow bucket. And uh, they had these, cans of chemicals that had holes in the top and they would like toss them into this tray and it would just rain this preservative chemical onto the diorama for the next however many years. So glass, weird chemicals. Yeah, so it's, it's scary to open these old dioramas. It's a little nerve wracking. So the other thing, yes, please. I don't know, that's a good, the question was how thick is the glass? Yeah, I don't know. Not safe. I'm going to guess at least quarter inch. It's not tempered. It's not tempered. We, so typically what we'll do is we'll replace, if we have an opportunity, uh, we had some old dioramas, we were able to replace the glass uh, with shatterproof glass. And that's if we ever have the opportunity, we do that. But these giant panes of glass are very expensive too. Did I see another question or we're good? Okay. So the other thing that happens when you have these old exhibits, you know, this is a problem. Uh, because the label was outdated. It was giving inaccurate information to visitors, which is really not good. You know, it really bothers me. Um, and of course, since these animals were first um, brought into the collection, their habitats changed. One subspecies is now endangered. Mammalogists learn more about their behavior and social structure. So think about over a hundred years, we've learned a lot more about these hyenas. Um, so this label is very outdated. And you can see from this photo, you know, there's no backdrop. The lighting is less than inspired. So it just doesn't look great. And again, the, the specimens were created by Carl Akeley. These, these, um, the taxidermy mounts were created by Carl Akeley, who's considered like very, you know, very good at what he did. So it, it just is painful to see them displayed in this way. Okay, so the second unplanned factor as part of this, you know, the first um, being 
the circumstances of you know them happening to be in this hall. The second unplanned factor was you know the work that was undertaken by previous staff and funded by previous donors. So I'll talk a little bit about how these hyenas came into our collection. So um, the photo um, to my right is Carl Akeley. The photo to my left is D.G. Elliott. Um, he was the first uh, zoology curator at the Field Museum, and Carl Akeley was a chief taxidermist at the Field Museum. And um, they embarked on an expedition to Somalia in 1896 uh, to bring back um, a large collection of African birds and mammal holdings. On that trip, Akeley and Elliot collected 205 skins representing 27 different species, according to Elliot's tally. Um, and I learned that one of the reasons they first embarked upon this expedition was actually to um, find and kill uh, a Somali wild ass. Um, it was a very different sense of conservation at that time. Uh, when, when people began realizing that Somali wild asses were, were dying off, um, they had a virus that was introduced from Italian livestock that was brought into Somalia. Uh, you know, a lot of scientists at the time feared that they would go extinct. And so their response was, well, let's go kill the last one. <laughs> I mean, and from their perspective, they're thinking these species, it, they're going to go extinct. So we want to, at the very least, preserve the specimen in our care so that visitors, museum visitors can see this and can, can learn from them. So I'm, I'm being a little cheeky, but um, that it was a very different attitude about conservation at that time. And so that, that was the plan. That was one of the main drivers, um, you know, in addition to bringing back all of these specimens, they wanted to uh, find and kill a Somali wild ass. They did, <laughs> but I will also add that they are not extinct. There are uh, a thousand still living, so they're definitely very endangered, but they did not go extinct. Um, so one of the things I got to do as an exhibition developer was to look through their journals. Um, so these are some examples of the journals. Elliot kept a journal on this expedition, which is pictured here. Um, and I, I just love looking at these little details. You know, the archives hold reports and letters um, from the time in the field. So this is true of a lot of expeditions is, um, you know, the scientists will record all of their information, keep journals, and then um, keep that at the museum for future research. Um, so this included expedition vouchers, itemized receipts um, that were, you know, of items that were purchased on museum business while they were on this trip. So it gives us a nice snapshot of their daily life. Um, in addition to the necessary meals, lodging, transportation, Akeley um, he bought two khaki lounge coats. Elliot uh, purchased fishing tackle and tags, uh, you know, presumably to, to collect specimens. So it's just nice kind of um, to get a sense of their, their life. Yes. Dinner with cigars and scotch. <laughs> I was like, what a meal. Yeah, so this, this was a... Um, uh, mm -hmm. Carol is observing, my mom is observing that uh, what is pictured is they're holding a menu and they, they enter, ended uh, their dinner with cigars. Yeah, which quite a meal. Yeah, so these, these are not small camping expeditions. They're pretty elaborate trips. Um, so this gives you a sense of their, their setup. So Akeley also wanted to bring a camera uh, to document the, the, the voyage. Um, and this piece of equipment at the time um, you know, it wasn't typical. It wasn't something you'd always bring. This is pretty early. Uh, now it's an essential part of field work. Um, but Elliot worried that he had already overspent, that Akeley had already overspent on expedition gear. So Akeley went ahead and bought the camera with his own money. Um, he purchased it in London for 40 pounds. He ultimately took 300 photographs in 1896, plus more on his later expedition. Um, and these, these are the images that you're seeing right now. So they gave us an unprecedented look at wildlife in Africa, but also people and ways of life at that time. Um, and this is a hand colored uh, glass lantern slide. So in addition to the camera, he was carrying these glass slides. So imagine, I, I say carrying, he probably personally was not carrying this, but, um, but that's a lot, very heavy. Uh, item to bring along. Um, and you see um, DG Elliott, he's got the white beard. You can kind of see him in the background uh, seated in his tent. Okay, so this brings me to the third unplanned element exerting influence over this exhibition and that's time and environment. Um, so in the 19th century, people were traveling the world, gathering specimens for museums and private collections. 
But think about it. The world in which these specimens were collected no longer exists. The Ottoman Empire was still a thing, right? The Tsar still controlled Russia. A lot has changed uh, since this expedition. Laws have changed, so, so has the landscape. Many animal populations have dwindled and in some cases gone extinct. I'm gonna show you a few photos of the expedition so you get a sense of the time in which they were undertaking this trip. Um, so the hyenas were collected in 1896, as I said, just as a reminder. Um, and when Carl Akeley and D.G. Elliott arrived in Somalia, it was the first expedition to Africa led by an American museum. The men arrived by boat and then assembled a team of 60 guides and hunters and porters, accompanied by 75 camels and ponies packed with provisions, which you can see pictured here. So again, Elliott was probably not carrying his own glass lantern slides. The camera that I mentioned earlier took these photos. So the expedition began, uh, began with a trek inland um, towards the, I'm very bad at pronouncing things, so I apologize if I get anything wrong, the Golis mountain range where this photo was taken. Um, they were trying to find land unspoiled by big game hunters, um, which at the time had overhunted a lot of these areas. They were looking for wild or herds of gazelle and other wildlife, which were still abundant. The caravan didn't travel light, um, as I said, they collected many specimens and, and carried Akeley's uh, photography equipment. Um, the photo was developed, uh, this photo was developed, all the photos from uh, four by five glass negatives, which were pretty heavy. The expedition in Somalia lasted eight months and was considered to be a huge success. Uh, Elliot and Akeley returned to the Field Museum with extensive field notes and photo uh, photographs along with hundreds of specimens. They had 115 fish, seven lizards, six snakes, 12 frogs and turtles, and 193 mammal skins. Among these were the skins of the Somali wild ass, which you see draped over the back. Yep. And the striped hyenas, which are in the diorama. So they skinned them in the field? They did. And I, I, so something that's interesting, one of the reasons that Akeley was considered to be so good at what he did, um, when taxidermy first came about, basically what people would do is they would leave the, the skull in the skin um, and then sometimes the hooves or you know the feet um, and then the rest of the body, they would stuff it with various materials, frequently sawdust. So what you kind of ended up with is like kind of a lumpy stuffed animal looking creature, right? So if you look at, I don't, I mean, if you go to a natural history museum, you can get a sense when you're looking at taxidermy of when it was made. If you look at kind of the form of the body, um, older taxidermy looks literally like a stuffed animal. What Akeley started doing, he was a sculptor. And so he would sculpt uh, out of clay, uh, the bodies of these animals. And, and he would do in the field, he would skin the animals and, and do really detailed drawings to try to get all the veins, all the structures right. Um, and then he would, he would lay the, the skin over um, the clay. Over time, he refined the method because clay is very heavy. So there's you know different things. Today, we use like a foam that you can carve. Um, so Akeley was basically started that process. And he was also one of the first people to do habitat dioramas, which is what it's referred to as when you have the whole scene, not just a kind of a base. He started at the Milwaukee Public Museum, which has one of the first habitat dioramas, went to the Field Museum, and then went to the American Museum of Natural History. So uh, he's amazing. Yeah. There's a book called Kingdom Under Glass, if anyone's interested in, in Akeley uh, in particular. All of the, you know, in dioramas, the other thing you don't always appreciate is how the, the plants are made. So they used to um, make them out of um, wax. And so there's this diorama at the Field Museum um, called Four Seasons, which shows deer in four different seasons. And his wife helped him make that diorama, was very, had a very big role in making it. And what she did was go out into the woods all four seasons and collect plant material and then hand make all of those leaves. So it's, it's just, it's incredible. Yeah. Sorry, that was a total tangent. Um, so this is one of the striped hyenas uh, that is in the diorama. So the expedition collected and photographed specimens like the striped hyena to preserve them for posterity. Uh, the museum's 1896 annual report stated, um, the collection brought to the Field Museum will be practically priceless. The time is near at hand when in certain lines of zoology, especially in the large mammals of the world, 
it will be forever impossible to procure examples. They are certain, most of them, to become as extinct as the mastodon or dodo are today. It literally gives me chills when I read that because here we are over a hundred years later and, and you know, people at that time kind of saw the way things were going. So really powerful. And again, they just had a different response to it than a lot of us do today. Sarah, are there any of those striped hyenas left? Striped hyenas are not extinct. Yeah, they still are around. Yeah, which is, I'm happy to say. They are um, at risk. They're an at-risk species. So. so this is a diagram from the Field Museum archives showing the plans for one of the diorama halls. In the early 1920s, the museum drew up plans for 20 different di dioramas in the Asian Mammals Hall, um, but expeditions to collect specimens ended when the Great Depression hit, uh, and then work on the diorama slowed. After the Tapir diorama, which opened in 1954, only one space remained vacant in the Asian Hall of Mammals. Meanwhile, the hyenas wound up stashed in a display case alongside uh, reptiles and amphibians, very out of place. Um, so this happened all over the country. Museums, you know, ran out of money, you know, and, and things were changing, you know, television was becoming big, you know, so this type of storytelling was, was waning. So now the exhibition role. So first it took someone to see an opportunity. So we have this empty diorama. We have this randomly placed stripe hyena case. Um, and one of the museum's dioramas had been boarded up. So, so we knew that there was this empty diorama. We didn't know what was inside. It was boarded up. There was just kind of a green wall that you would walk by every day. We had no idea. Uh, so we opened it up. We didn't know what we were going to find inside. We didn't know if there was some old diorama that was half finished. Um, you know, we, we didn't know what we'd see, but essentially it was just a storage space. So this is, this is what we found when we took the wall off. This is what was inside. Yeah. It was piled full of things that were used to make other dioramas. So again, museums run out of space. We stash things in random locations. And then somebody that did this leaves and we have no idea what's in there. So another opportunity was uh, that staff saw a built-in means to do fundraising and marketing, uh, to, a way to fundraise and market for this project. And that was uh, an internet series called The Brain Scoop with Emily Grasley. Um, so this was in 2015, uh, the Science Education YouTube channel referred to as The Brain Scoop teamed up with museum fans from all over the world to fund the creation of the Field Museum's first new habitat diorama in over 60 years. So thanks to contributions from across the globe, the campaign raised enough money to move the striped hyenas into a brand new home in the Hall of Asian Mammals. The crowdfunding campaign, I got a lot of attention, you know, all over the country, was featured on NPR, featured in the Chicago Reader and in other, uh, you know, blogs. And at the end, around 1,500 contributors helped raise enough money. They raised um, $150,000 in just six weeks. So this was funded by the public this diorama. So that's Emily Grasley right there. This is where I come into the story. I was an exhibition developer at the time and I was assigned to the project. So again, when I started, all of these, all of these things were already in motion or, or had already happened a hundred years ago. And so my role as the exhibition developer was to make two types of choices. The first was choices based in science and research, and the second was visitor-centric choices. So the team researched uh, hyenas' native habitat. I consulted with a curator of mammals, Larry Haney, and uh, we meticulously crafted every aspect to ensure accuracy, from the landform uh, to the sky, to the backdrop, to the plants, to the other animals in the scene. Every single detail in the diorama is a conscious choice, including you know, the bat-eared fox you see hiding in the corner or you will see when I show you the final diorama. So was, the, was it based on 1905 or 1890 or was it based on their habitat now? I got to make that choice. So the question was, was it based in 1905 or 1800s or was it based on now? And so that, that is a choice, yeah. So I'll, I'll tell you, I'm just a few. But I, I think it's important to realize this. You know, I think when people walk into museums and see these dioramas, they feel, you know, they're, they're done, they've been made. 
everything in the diorama was a choice. So it is scientifically accurate, but it's also an artistic representation. So yes. Is every person that does your job as fussy as you? <laughs> is every, the question was, is every person who does my job as fussy as I am? I will say I am one of the less fussy people. <laughs> I am less meticulous than some people. Um, I have. A, I, I thought I was going to be an artist. I thought I was going to be a designer. So um, I think the fact that I do research and writing for a living came as a huge shock to my parents. So um, I, the thing that I that makes me really good at my job is that I'm a good communicator and I'm passionate. Um, and uh, I think that's what makes me good at my job. I, I'm detail oriented, but not as not as much as some people. Um, Okay, uh, so the, the way that the Field Museum um, works with taxidermists like Carl Akeley and collectors like D.G. Elliott, um, who conducted their work is, um, you know, actually let me back up. So the fact that Carl Akeley and D.G. Elliott were so meticulous actually made some of the scientific choices I was making a lot easier. Talk about meticulous, they were meticulous. And the reason I wanted to include this slide is, is an example of that. So in the past, you know, when people created taxidermy, a lot of the time, um, you know, when I was talking about the stuffed animal taxidermy, some of these people had never seen those animals. They'd never seen those animals living. So they didn't know how to make it a lion look alive or an orangutan look alive. They had no idea how they moved or how they lived. Um, and so that was another thing that the Field Museum and Carl Akeley did differently is they would visit these animals in the field. And when they were there working on these dioramas, they would pick a specific location and they would take soil samples um, they would, they brought their paints, you know, so they had a huge palette of paints. So they would do these color swatches, which um, I don't think I have. Yeah, I don't have a photo of that. But I, part of my job was to go in the collections and look at these old material. And so, yeah, they had like all of these little color swatches that they did to meticulously match each element in the environment to make sure that when they recreated them in the diorama, they were the right shade of ochre. You know, everything was that detailed. Um, and then you can see that they're making notes on the photos, you know, where what elements are gonna include in the diorama. You can see this is a watercolor study of the leaves. So again, kind of making sure that all that color is accurate, all the details are accurate. So really attention to detail. So that made my job a lot easier because they had done a lot of that research in the past. So as I said, they took very detailed notes. I spent hours in the record room trying to decipher their journals and to figure out where specifically each animal was killed so I could know where to stage the scene. So we, we didn't know, they didn't say in the diorama where that was supposed to take place. We just kind of vaguely knew that they were striped hyenas. And so my job, again, working with a mammals curator was to figure out, okay, where should we set this scene? Um, so we looked at you know current and past hyena ranges um, and then I looked at the expedition journals and found, you know, okay, they were in Somalia. I knew what years they were there. Um, and then I, I, I had to comb through the journals to figure out when specifically, because it was a nine month journey, when specifically the hyenas were killed. And so handwriting, let me tell you, these guys did not have great handwriting. And so I was sitting at my computer, you know, I'd taken photos of all of these pages of their journal and I'm trying to transcribe it. I'm trying to figure out what each word is. And I remember when I came across this passage, because this for me was when I found it. So this is from DG Elliott's journal. Tonight, I'm going to tie a sheep near the traps in the hopes of capturing a leopard. We went out about nine o'clock to see if anything had molested our bait but all was quiet. However, towards two o'clock in the morning, a sentry came to the camp and said something was at the traps and he had heard the sheep. So D went out and found a striped hyena caught by two feet in as many traps. It had killed the sheep and with some friends he had with him, he nearly ate it up. D killed the animal with buckshot. <laughs> so that entry was dated. So I knew when this first striped hyena was killed and so then I was able to kind of, okay, that was a starting point for me. And I found other passages for the other hyenas. So here's what I learned. This is when we get to the very tricky pronunciations. Uh, the expedition went to Somalia, specifically to Wukoi, Galabid region. Um, and these marked on the map in the red dots, these are the approximate locations of where the hyenas were found. 
So I began searching the region for specific diorama locations. Um, and so I, I was online, you know, searching these regions, looking for photos. And I, I had a sense from talking to the mammals curator, you know, what types of environments the hyenas would live in, you know, where would they make their homes? And so I was looking for kind of rocky outcroppings. Hyenas, um, you know, tend to like uh, live in caves. Um, they hunt a little farther away from their caves. Um, so I was looking for regions that kind of fit that description. So these are three of the sites that I identified. Um, and, and so essentially what I would do as an exhibit developer is I would do all this research, I would find all these images, I would meticulously log all of my sources, you know, so that because of course the scientists want to know, where did you find this? Is it accurate? You know, you can't just Wikipedia things. Uh, and so th these are three of the locations that I, that I found photos of that I felt like would be a good starting point for a scene. Um, and also, although the new diorama was located in the Hall of Asian Mammals, uh, we knew that we needed to set the scene in Somalia, in Africa, uh, the place where most of the animals were originally killed. It had been previously proposed that the hyena's den where they live, as I said, often in caves or burrows dug into hillsides would appear in the background of the scene. But when I spoke with a mammals curator, I realized that animals don't typically feed near their dwelling, um, but we knew that we could kind of use it as a starting point. Um, so we were looking for rocky hills, ravines or crevices. So these are my three choices. Which one would you pick? Middle? Yeah, so this is the one I picked. Yeah, so Daga Cure, Cure, I'm so bad at pronouncing this, um, uh, translates to the head of the stone, the stone with the head in the Somali language. Uh, the site is located in a beautiful, naturally green landscape with fertile farming lands and nearby rock shelters made with stony outcroppings like you're seeing here. Uh, the rocks resting on top of each other um, on approximately four kilometers uh, long granite range. So granite is what's underneath this. Um, the greatest number of rock art panels depicting large cows in Somaliland are found inside of the shelter. So there's rock cave paintings inside. Um, so it's a very famous site. Um, making this very unique um, among rock art sites in Somaliland. Um, so the site must have been important to the people that lived here in this region thousands of years ago. And it, it still remains important today that to the people that live there. So it felt like a good choice for a lot of reasons. And also another problem we had is locating photos. You know, I, I unfortunately, unlike Akeley, could not travel to take photos of this location. So I had to find what I could online as reference. Um, so because this was a famous site, there was a lot of documentation. So now to answer my dad's question, time of day and year. So we knew that the scene had to play, take place at night. And the reason for this is, as you saw, the hyenas were feeding, they're active. Um, so it needed to take place, I should say, at night or near dawn, the time of day that hyenas are typically feeding and active. Um, I knew from the journals that one hyena was killed in May, uh, two were killed in July and one in August. So kind of given that range of time, um, we decided that the diorama should be set in uh, Haga, which is the dry season, which lasts from July to September. So that gave us some choices in terms of how should the plants look, you know, what, what is out and about at this time of year. Um, so I just got to pick a day basically within that range. I just randomly picked a day. I, I wish I remembered why, but um, I picked August 6th. 1896, which is, you know, in the range when they would have been in Somalia um, at 5.30 a.m. So I had to pick a particular time. Yeah. And the reason for that is we worked with the Aldler Planetarium in Chicago, which is right next door to the Field Museum. And uh, we brought a scientist over um, from the planetarium to the museum and we gave him the date. He brought up this fancy software that he had on his computer and he was able to calculate, which is what you're seeing here, um, what exactly the stars looked like on August 6th, 1896 at 5.30 a.m. So the stars in the diorama are very accurate. <laughs> Um, so, you know, the hyenas would have spent all night foraging for food before they found this meal that you see pictured in the scene. They're trying to finish it before the sun rises to get back to their den. In Somalia, where the hyenas live, it's located uh, just north of the equator, so the stars in the night sky are similar to the ones um, you would see when you stargaze here. So you can find in this image, I think there's Orion, Gemini, 
uh, Canis Minor. So all of those are represented in the diorama. So the other thing I was doing is looking at plant life. Um, you know, they had botanists on staff that I could work with to do this. And so I, I got to, this was another benefit of having all of Akeley's photos, all of those lantern slides. So all of these are photos that Akeley took. So I was looking at all of the little details, all of the plants in these scenes to try to figure out what we should include in the diorama. Um, so this was an immense resource to me. And I, I met with the botanist at the Field Museum to help identify what these are. So he gave me some names. I found more reference photos for them. So there are not many plants that flourish in Somalia, especially during this time of year in the dry August heat, um, but you're seeing aloe vera, which seems to be doing fine. Um, in some of Akeley's photos, you can see it thriving there as well. Uh, and those plants store a large amount of moisture in their leaves, uh, which they draw upon during the dry season. So that seemed like a perfect choice. And then the tree you see is uh, the dragon blood tree. So another tree that you find in the region, which is very iconic, it's, it's a beautiful tree. Okay, and so then I got to choose animals. Uh, so again, kind of thinking in this region, um, what would have lived here, what would make sense. Um, so we have the four striped hyenas already in the diorama and they're partially devouring an ungulate, um, which we realized was some species of gazelle. And so those were all present in Akeley's original design. Uh, we, you know, every collection in the museum wanted to add something. This was a high profile project. You know, birds wanted to get something in, insects wanted to get something in. Um, so I met with all of these curators and they made recommendations. Uh, and we had to find species that, you know, would have been nocturnal. We had to pick smaller species that could fit without making it look too crowded. Um, you know, you don't want it to be like a where's Waldo of animals. You want it to feel like natural. Um, so these were all the choices I considered. And then these were the choices I actually made these animals. And, and the bat-eared fox, which you see in the top center, um, that was actually collected by Akeley on the same expedition. And he'd been in storage for years. So it was nice to finally bring him out. And so all that combined, these are kind of the final photos, reference photos uh, for the scene. So these are all choices that I made as the exhibit developer with the help of science and research. And so then the second kind of choices, visitor choices, um, those were also relatively easy to make because I had a really talented team of people in the exhibitions department that were working with me. Um, so you see here, pictured some of the people that I worked with. Um, we have a rec replication department there, um, which I think only has about four or five staff members, um, but they were my primary contacts for this. And so they built the maquette for the diorama, painted the background scene, uh, created all of the individual leaves, created all of the boulders. Um, so somebody was in charge of each of those aspects. So, you know, I love this photo because in some ways it reminded me of the early work that Akeley was doing, you know, when he was uh, notating all those colors in the field. So we did the same thing. These, this was a color, um, you know, just kind of sketches that the, the painter was, was doing. So we had, I remember a meeting where we talked about soil color for an hour. You know, we had like 10 scientists standing around in a circle. We're looking at all these different color swatches and deciding, okay, what's right for Somalia in this region? What's the absolute perfect shade? Um, so very meticulous. And then I love this photo as well. This shows you a little bit of the process. So the, the artists that created the, the overall scene um, did sketches first, which we then approved, you know, and then he created this, this maquette. Um, so, you know, a lot is done on computers, but for dioramas, it just doesn't really work. You need to do it by hand. Um, so this is a tiny little model. So the person who made the model up actually was using that, his or her skills yes. to decide how to place everything. That's, that's correct. So the question was, the person was, was using his or her skills to determine how to place everything. And that's absolutely correct. So I, I created a list of what would be included. Um, and I, you know, it's funny, you just feel like, really, you're going to let me make this decision? Like, okay, you know, I'm, you know, 30 deciding what's going to be preserved for a hundred years at the museum. But I said, okay, one fox, two dung beetles, three aloe plants, you know, and this is my laundry list. And then they decided how to place all of those. Yeah. So, and, and there's negotiation, you know, anytime you're working with a designer, I would indicate, okay, it's okay. If you cut one of these, like, well, let's see what fits. Let's, let's kind of work together on this. So they would bring me into review. They would bring the curators into review. 
And so then I love this photo. This is Kate. Uh, she's creating these boulders. And so you can kind of get a sense of her process here. You know, they have a big replication shop space. Um, you know, she created these, these ap after we did this little maquette where everything was placed, um, you then make them full size. So they would do these floor sketches. Just, we did like paper all over the floor and we drew the footprint of each element and then walked in and kind of imagined, okay, this is how it would look. Um, and then she builds this wood model, covers it in chicken wire, covers that in plaster and paper mache, um, and then paints it. Um, so that th these are all the kind of different phases of her process. And then this is Susan making each of the, the um, aloe plant fronds. So you can kind of get a sense. So nature just includes details that we can't recreate as artists. So um, we um, create casts of actual aloe leaves. Um, and so she individually casts different leaves. So again, you're using, it's a wonderful combination of science and, and nature and human choice because she's selecting which aloe leaf to put into each of the, the bundles. Artistry. artistry, a lot of artistry as well, yeah. She's wearing uh, oven mitts. I love that detail because she's using hot glue to bind the base together. And so she's trying to find a way of not burning her hands. And then also when you're creating the cast, you've got the two sides, you have to cast each side of the, of the aloe. Um, and so you cover one side with um, dish soap to keep it from sticking together. So little tricks like that, that you learn through replication that you would never know. So we've come a little bit further from wax leaves. This is much more durable than what would have been used in Akeley's time. And then this is Aaron. He's the gentleman that painted the backdrop. And so something that is really fun that I didn't realize before working on dioramas was when you're in a museum, there's a perfect place to stand in front of every single diorama um, because there's a certain amount of math and trickery that goes into trying to make it look like you are immersed in the scene. It's this tiny little room and we're trying to make it look like it's forever, you know, that you're just in a landscape. Um, and so they plot from a particular perspective. And so here, what he's doing is testing, making sure, you know, that he's got that perspective. Um, and, and so we actually did this in full view of the public. Um, you know, we put stanchions up and then he painted the scene uh, in front of everyone. And I had a digital rail interpreting what was going on. So telling stories about the, the history and the present. So it's really fun. Oh no, okay. So here is the final diorama. So this is what was created. Where's the fox? Yeah, where is the fox? He is hidden behind a rock. He's got his little ears sticking up. Yes. Let me see. Do I have the, the full guy? So the, the hyenas are the, the anthra, factory, and the fox is factory. Yes. So a lot of this is just artists drawing. Yes. So you mix the art. Yes. The science. Yeah. So so the question was, uh, the hyenas are taxidermied, the fox is ta taxidermied, and then a lot of the rest is replications. So it's a nice mix of science and artistry, and that's absolutely true. So this was the final display. I left just a few months before um, it came to fruition from the Field Museum. So a couple of years later, I got to go back and finally see it in person. Um, and I just love knowing that, yeah, a hundred years, this will, this will still be up. Um, so as our cities and building projects expand, it's more important than ever to remember that we are not encroaching on nature, we are part of nature. And so dioramas are a wonderful way of helping remind people of that. So I guess I'll stop there. This I didn't think I would be able to take up 90 minutes, but I think you all asked some wonderful questions and, and help me. Yeah. So really we can ask like maybe there's one question. Is there anything else? I've got a question online, but also two we have a group for curators. They're scientists. Now I can pass this around. Sorry. Curators are scientists. Do they work for the museum or are they at universities and they come use the museum resources? I mean, it seems to me that's a huge staff to have yeah. and it's hidden to most of us. Yeah. Yeah. That is a great observation. And, and so 
museums really do want to have curators on staff. And, um, you know, we frequently have curators that are shared between universities and museums. A lot of the curatorial staff at the Field Museum also worked at the University of Chicago. In, uh, at the Carnegie Museum, a lot of um, the scientists also work for Pitt. Um, so that's that's common. Um, but, we, you know, we do want them on staff. I mean, again, um, yeah, it's a huge expense. I mean, and, and you're right, people don't realize this. And I think one of the trickiest things to do in an exhibitions department is to try to figure out how to tell the public about what we do and to not just make it like, we don't want to just, you know, thump our own chests, we, you know, but it's an interesting story. You know, people don't realize how much is going on behind the scenes. I didn't like natural history museums that much before I worked at a natural history museum, because I kind of felt like, oh, they're all the same, you know, everywhere you go, there's animals and there's insects and there's minerals. But I, that was because I didn't realize all of the individual scientists and the individual, you know, work that was happening. You know, um, I wanted to work in a history museum, not natural history, but uh, it just kind of, it, uh, it's, I love them now. It's the only place I can imagine working. Sarah, this has been a great presentation. Uh, generally speaking, how are museums funded? How are museums funded? Um, a mix. Uh, so natural history museums, a lot of them have endowments. Um, and so the Carnegie Museum of Natural History, the Field Museum, the LA County Museum of Natural History all had endowments. So a large in, like influx of money that was uh, put aside for the museum and per perpetuity. And essentially what we do with that endowment is we don't touch it. Um, so all of the, um, all, yes, all of the interest is, is intended to go towards operations. And so if a museum is doing poorly, they'll, they'll dip into the endowment, but that's always a bad sign. So um, it, yeah, it's, it's to kind of keep us running over time. And so technically, yeah, the Carnegie Museum of Natural History has an endowment and a good chunk of money from that, but we're only using the interest. And, and for us in particular, we started as um, one museum in Oakland, in our Oakland campus in Pittsburgh. I don't know how familiar any of you are with Pittsburgh, but we expanded to be four museums. And so now the endowment that was intended for one museum is supporting the Carnegie Science Center, the Andy Warhol Museum, the Art Museum, and the Natural History Museum. So it's, uh, it's tough. And so we also, we do a lot of uh, grant writing, a lot of grant writing. Um, scientists frequently fund their own projects through grant writing, so it's an incredible output. Um, it's a lot of their time goes towards that. And then also in exhibitions, we do, we um, yeah, seek money from NEH, the National Endowment for Humanities, National, um, the Science Foundation. Um, and then of course, private donors. There's a lot of, you know, museum, it, and every museum has different, um, Ticketing is more or less important depending on the institution, ticket sales. So for us, it is important. It's quite important. For the Field Museum, it, it was just kind of a drop in the bucket. You know, the ticket sales were, were less important. Um, for the Museum of Man in San Diego, Museum of Us, they changed their name. Uh, ticket sales kept them going. So during COVID, they ended up having to lay off about um, 70 people of their 80 person staff. So it was a huge hit. Yeah, so it, it just depends from institution to institution. Main question. Yes, I have a couple things from online. Uh, back when we were talking about bird birth decline and BBT, uh, recent discovery of polybrominated biondol and bald eagle death from poisoning of the brain and spinal cord mm -hmm. of these avian species. It would be interesting to analyze the nerve cells of these recently diseased birds for signs of central nervous diseases as a possible link to their untimely death. So kind of an idea about um, using the bird samples um, there. And then a question, um, Thank very, you. very impressive talk. The dead tree on the left of the picture currently showing has many spikes. They look like galvanized nails. What kind of tree is that? Oh my gosh. I think that was, I think that was the dragon's blood tree, but uh, let me go back. I had like a more detailed list of all of the plants. Um, yeah, and they're thorns. They look like spikes. Yeah, they're thorns. Uh, yeah, the only one I have noted is a dragon blood tree. So I don't remember if that is that. It doesn't, it looks different. I think the dragon blood tree is what's in the background. It so it could be a dead one. Yeah, I, I apologize. I don't remember what that species is. Yeah, I had to refresh my memory on all of this because I did this. They added that 
but seven years ago. <laughs> yeah. They, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Well, thank you, everybody. <laughs> thank you. And thank you, Sarah. Yeah. And what what was I supposed to? Oh, you will get an online evaluation from Ian. That should be in your inbox this afternoon. What? Did you want to do a short survey? Oh. oh, no, we're ready? out of time, I think. I don't want to. I, I had a, I was going to ask you all what exhibition you would do. Next, do you want to? Is it on paper? No, it's it's here. Oh. Oh, you have oh. <laughs> so we have four exhibitions we're trying to decide between. Uh, the first one is the Institute of Beetle Technology which you can kind of imagine all of the different beetle technologies that people can use uh, to innovate. Um, the next one is um, Egypt on the Nile, looking at you know, the development of civilizations uh, in Egypt along the Nile River and looking at um, you know, the natural world in conjunction with uh, the human history, looking at those together. The one in the bottom right, is from our alcohol house, which again is not as, it's not alcohol, it's ethanol preserving these specimens. We're thinking about opening that alcohol house to tours. It's a beautiful old building. Should we open it up and, and you know, do that? Or the one on the bottom left, my left, nature's rainbow, uh, looking at um, the diversity of species. I'm gonna read this one because I wanna make sure I get it right. A nature's rainbow, curators study how millions of years of sex and natural selection have resulted in a spectacular rainbow of bodies and family dynamics across the tree of life in birds in particular. Thanks to new scientific research, there's now evidence that diverse sexualities often occur in naturally in humans and in other animals. And these findings have revealed um, surprising natural histories and provided answers to questions like, what is a female or male? How do scientists think sex evolved? And what are evolutionary benefits of same-sex sexuality? So those are four different exhibitions we're considering. Who would, who would do number one? Vote for one? Yeah, let's vote for two, how about that? Yeah. Okay, so I wanted to have a, no, I'll just have to remember one, two, three, four. Five, six, seven. So seven for uh, Beetle Technology. How many for number two? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Oh gosh, seven again uh, for Egypt on the Nile. Oops. How many for number three? One, two, three, four, five, six, six. That's still pretty good, pretty good for uh, the alcohol house. And then how many for number four? Ah, overwhelming. I got one. Yeah. Nature's rainbow. So it's possible that you will see one, two, or all of these in the coming years at the Carnegie Museum of Natural History. So thank you. This was fun. <laughs>